everybody. Uh, welcome to our uh, our um, third summer virtual seminar series. We still have some people coming on, so uh, but we'll uh, we'll get uh, started, um, and I'll admit people as we go along. If everyone could just mute themselves, and uh, we'll have a question and answer uh, session. Um, also, uh, we have uh, a uh, a um, a survey that we would like you to uh, fill out. Uh, I'll post the link in the uh, chat, and after the seminar, if you could fill out that survey, that would help us out in uh, improving uh, the planning for future uh, seminars. So I'll post that link in uh, in the chat room. So uh, this is our third uh, virtual summer seminar series, which uh, you can access the previous ones at our, uh, our website, at the New York Sea Grant website. Um, our first one was by Dr. Uh, Chris Gobler in June, and that is up on the website. And then that was followed by Dr. Jace Bernhardt in July. And today we're going to have uh, Dr. Scott Steinschneider. Uh, from Cornell speak and this uh, is being recorded and um, will be posted on our YouTube channel and on this website afterwards. And to your new, to the new people joining us, welcome aboard. Uh, the next uh, the next seminar following Scott's will be on September 24th, which will be by uh, Dr. Karen Lindbergh and Kayla Smith at SUNY ESF. And we'll be sending out announcements for that after, after this seminar. So, um, so right now I'm going to post the link for the, uh, to everybody for the survey. And if you could fill that out afterwards, that would be really great. To get started, I'm going to introduce uh, Mary Osterman, who is our extension specialist, who has worked closely with uh, Scott on this project that he'll be speaking on. And uh, Mary will just say a few words of introduction, and then Scott will get started, and afterwards we will have uh, questions and answers. Take it away, Mary. Thanks, Lane. Um, so as Lane mentioned, Scott and I have been working together for probably, I don't know, the last four or five years. So, you know, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Scott Steinschneider. He's an associate professor at the Department of Biological and Environmental Engineering at Cornell University. His primary expertise is in statistical hydroclimatology with two principal focus areas. The first being the characterization of hydroclimactic variability across space-time scales, and the second being the analysis of hydroclimate impacts in the water sector. Um, he does work on all scales focused, um, or water systems globally, um, in, across the U.S. and locally, which is what we're really focusing on today. So today's seminar, um, you're going to hear Dr. Steinschneider speak about a recent Sea Grant funded project to develop a flood risk mapping tool for Lake Ontario. And one of the things that I hope you really enjoy learning more about is how Dr. Um, Scott uh, Steinschneider's team uh, really paired modeling with social science to develop a tool that um, not only is, you know, of highest scientific caliber, but one that is really uh, in need and also very functional for the end users, those coastal folks along Lake Ontario. So with that, I'll turn it over to Scott. Scott, Thanks. you should be able to share your screen now. Yep, I will go ahead and do that. Um, and let me just make sure I got it in the correct presenter mode. Can you see the, the correct version, sort of the slideshow presentation? Yes, we see it in presenter mode. So good, right? Good. Okay. Um, so yes, thank you, everyone. Thanks, Mary, for the introduction. Also, thanks for the promotion. I'm, I'm, a, I'm an assistant professor, but I'll, I'll take associate. <laughs> Be great. Um, You're welcome. That was easy paperwork, right? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. So this is great. 
I'll um, let make you full professor. Why not? <laughs> well, fantastic. Um, yeah, so uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, what I want to share today, as, as Mary indicated, was a product that got developed from several years of work now uh, on a, a probabilistic parcel level inundation prediction model that we are hoping is going to be of, of value to shoreline communities along Lake Ontario. And before I get started, I just want to do a couple things. One, I want to acknowledge everyone who's worked on this project. So first and foremost, I would want to acknowledge Kyla Semendinger, who's the, my graduate student, who's pretty much done all of this work. Um, I'm really just presenting her work in, in this seminar. Uh, I'd also want to acknowledge Rich Stedman and Bruce Lauber, their colleagues here at Cornell, who did a lot of the social science the, and stakeholder engagement work uh, that sort of underscores the tool that we developed. Mary as well. Uh, Mary was sort of our extension specialist, but not she didn't just sort of connect us with folks. She really contributed directly to sort of how this tool got developed in its design. And so she also deserves uh, a good deal of credit. And then there, there's been a lot of other uh, students, undergraduates and MN students, in particular, uh, Jillian Foley did some work that uh, got into this tool as well. So I just want to thank all of them. Before uh, going into the presentation, I, I thought it'd be useful to provide a little bit of history of how this project came to be, because it, it actually has something of an interesting timeline. Uh, so this all started, this work started, I guess, November of 2016 now, which is quite a bit ago. And, and back in November of 2016, some folks from Wayne County, the Soil and Water District, and, and a couple others, I think, came down to Cornell and they wanted to engage with faculty because they were concerned about how a new lake level management plan on Lake Ontario would potentially influence the levels that coastal communities would see and negatively impact them. And, and they were concerned about that. This sort of struck my interest and I sort of wanted to see how I could get involved. So I began to write a proposal to Sea Grant to explore sort of flood risk and how we could quantify flood risk on the shoreline and, and bring this information to coastal stakeholders. And during that process of writing that proposal, water levels on Lake Ontario got very, very high starting around January of 2017 and then peaking to a new record in May and then June of 2017. Uh, this then was followed by another record setting flood in 2019. And so the, the timing of this, you know, of course, all of this flooding was very unfortunate, but the timing of this project and how it got started was, uh, I guess the timing was good. And so what I wanna share with you today is sort of the process we went through of, of how we actually tried to craft a tool that could provide some useful inundation predictions to shoreline communities and how we went about that. And I'll, I'll break the talk up into three major components. The first was actually a lot of effort uh, led by um, Rich, Bruce, and, and Mary on actually soliciting feedback from stakeholders and really what asking what they needed here. Um, so there's, there's already a lot of expertise in municipal and county level governments about how to deal with flooding. And it was unclear exactly what was needed to complement that and provide added value. And so we, we went through a process to try and figure out really what should this tool be uh, that would, would provide something that, uh, of use. Uh, in the second part of the talk, I'll, I'll actually go through the tool itself. So the name of this tool, it's something called the flood tool. This is actually a tool that was developed by Baird Incorporated. Uh, it was funded by the IJC, the International Joint Commission. That's the commission that actually manages the lake. These tools were developed as part of a long study to try and figure out how to manage the lake and its impacts of managing the lake. And actually the idea behind this project was, could we take some of those models and tools that were developed for that purpose and bring it to local communities and help them better understand their own flood risk, particularly under sort of evolving conditions on Lake Ontario. And then I'll end uh, with just sort of where we want to go with some of this work, what we're doing now and sort of where, where we would like to take it. Okay. So, so the very beginning, I think the place to start is actually trying to figure out 
what content should be in this flood prediction tool that would be of value to local communities. So when we started the project, we had an idea of what we wanted to do. There was a series of flood uh, inundation models that had been developed in previous work. We thought we could bring that to local communities and that would be helpful. But the specifics of really what was needed by local communities, the type of information and how that information would be conveyed, that was less clear. And so we went through uh, sort of a couple of years of work in parallel to the model development to really figure, uh, figure out how we wanted to tailor this tool to maximize its utility. And we did this in, in those several steps in this, but there are two major things that we did. Uh, number one, in the summer of 2018, so this was early on in this project when it actually got going, uh, Bruce and Rich led a, a series of 18 semi-structured telephone interviews. And so we tried to identify uh, landowners, property owners, municipal officials, and county level official, uh, officials like from the offices of emergency management from a few key counties along the shoreline where we had some good partnerships, um, specifically Monroe, Wayne, and Oswego counties. And we were just trying to figure out what type of content in a flood tool would be useful for them to improve their response to flooding. And this range, we have, we have, I won't go over all of the questions we asked, it was, uh, or that Bruce and Rich, uh, Rich asked, I should say. Um, there was a wide range of, of uh, information we were trying to get at, but it sort of boils down to, you know, we were asking them what information were they using now? What information did they find particularly valuable during the 2017 flood? And what type of information do they wish they had and, and that would have actually really helped them improve their response and their long-term planning. So we went through that process and we got a series of feedback. And then in a following uh, year, following summer of 2019, we followed up with three separate two-hour focus groups where we sat down with smaller groups of people and asked another sort of set of questions trying to elicit an understanding of but in addition to what type of information they wanted, we already had kind of a sense of that from the interviews. Also, what should the presentation of this information look like? How should it be uh, put together in some sort of deliverable and made available to folks? And I'm gonna summarize the basic gist from both the interviews and the focus groups in just a couple of slides. And so I, I'm putting here a few quotes that we collected uh, from those exercises. You don't, you don't have to read these quotes, um, but I would just point you to a few different broad categories of responses that we saw pretty repetitively across all of this uh, stakeholder solicitation. The first was, we asked a lot of questions about whether or not folks wanted long-term estimates of flood risk. So just over the long term, several years out, decades out, what frequency would you, should you be expecting flooding to occur versus shorter term forecasting. So can you tell me a week out, a month out, what the risk of inundation is for that particular year? There was a lot of feedback uh, really uh, in favor of forecasts working on forecast information, uh, folks felt that if they had better forecast information, they would be able to be more preemptive in defending key spaces along the shoreline. And there was sort of an understanding that there were going to be many locations along the shoreline that would need protection, but with good forecasts at specific lead times, which I'll talk about in a second, you'd be able to prioritize where to defend sooner and, and where to sort of focus on later. So some, some form of triaging. In addition, there was a lot of uh, feedback on the resolution of available information and available forecasts. Specifically, there are some inundation uh, mapping tools that are out there. Uh, the NOAA Lake Level Viewer is a really good example of one. And a lot of these tools, they have a lot of utility. So I, I do not want to downplay a lot of what those tools offer, which is quite a lot. But in this particular instance, in terms of responding to flooding in real time, folks felt that some of these mapping tools, the resolution wasn't quite good enough. So for instance, the lake level viewer, you can sort of look at 
inundation with different, with at one foot at a time. You can change the lake level one foot at a time and see what that does to inundation. And that was thought to be a little bit too coarse because I, I sort of uh, highlighted one quote I thought was good. This emergency was being measured in inches. A, and a couple extra inches at that high of a water level was causing pretty big problems in terms of additional flooding. And I should note, the reason that the lake level viewer does sort of course in how they allow you to see uh, flood inundation levels, I spoke with them about this and, and they were very clear. There's a good deal of uncertainty in a lot of the data that underscores inundation mapping. And so that, that was a purposeful choice to sort of reflect the accuracy of the available elevation information you had. So we were trying to figure out a way to reconcile data uncertainties and the need for higher resolution uh, inundation information. And I'll get to sort of how we did that in a second. Another key piece was lead time. So I indicated that a lot of stakeholders indicated that forecasts would be useful. And then the question is, okay, forecasts at what lead time do you really need them? Do you need forecasts of flooding an hour ahead, a day ahead, three days ahead, a week ahead. And a lot of the feedback that we got was that it would be particularly useful if folks had a few weeks of lead time. So one, one comment was, we think we need somewhere between three and four weeks to get ready for a potential flooding event. And so that sort of geared our minds towards what type of forecast lead time we should be aiming for in any product we develop. And then finally, it was pretty widespread, the consensus of how important wind and waves are in terms of the actual flood risk that folks face. So it's not just the static level of Lake Ontario broadly, but rather locally on the shoreline, depending on the wind conditions, you can get storm surge and water pushing up against the shoreline that adds additional water level elevation and then you can get wave activity on top of that with wave runup. And all of that really is what, in combination with a high static level, all of those things actually lead to a lot of the flooding problems. And so we wanted to make sure that we, we accounted for that. So one other just uh, interesting uh, little tidbit from a lot of these stakeholder feedback exercises, um, there was very, initially we were actually thinking of providing long-term risk information. We were gonna try and give folks a sense of what the 100 year flood, for instance, might look like under the new management plan under maybe some different climate scenarios. And a lot of the feedback we got was that there would be very little trust in those sorts of long-term risk estimates. Just given a lot of the changes that have been happening on Ontario with respect to the recent flooding, as well as to changes in the management plan of the lake. And so rather there was a, there were, people were much more receptive to the idea of advancing forecast products. And so we wanted, to, we wanted to focus there. We thought that would be useful, but also help build trust because we'd focus on a, a product that folks at least initially thought was more feasible. Um, and really the goal of this forecasting product, this inundation forecast product is to help municipal, help organize municipal and county uh, emergency response to flooding. And I should really say help complement all of the stuff they're already doing. So uh, in a lot of places along the shoreline, the offices of emergency management and local municipalities, particularly after 2017 and into 2019, they really got down a good system for how to try and organize their response to these events. And so we were looking to sort of add value to a lot of the expertise that was already there. And as part of that, one thing that we really wanted to do was help, help municipal officials communicate to property owners what their specific risk was. So a lot of the feedback that we got from certain municipal officials was that they were spending a lot of their time and it was difficult for them just to communicate to homeowners that those homeowners really needed to prepare their own homes for flooding, move things to higher elevations, get ready, figure out how they would deploy sandbags on their own property. There was a lot of challenges around that. And a, and a, a mayor, one particular mayor that we spoke to said, yeah, he was getting calls from secondary homeowners who weren't even living there. They were living elsewhere and they only come up to Lake Ontario for the summer. And those secondary homeowners were 
asking the mayor to go check on their house and help prepare for flooding. And the mayor could not do that. Of course, they had so many other responsibilities. And it was just communicating to folks that they had to sort of be ready to take care of their own home and do that in advance of the actual flooding well before it started so people could, for instance, prepare to come up to the shoreline if they weren't there. So we were trying to sort of develop something sort of towards, uh, to help towards that end. Okay, so now what I wanna do is I wanna pivot over and get into some of the actual flood tool design, the model design itself. And in the title, I say it's a probabilistic inundation prediction tool. And I wanna just sort of emphasize that idea with one particular plot we feel like it's very important to propagate and convey the uncertainty and a lot of the data we use when we make these inundation predictions because it has a big impact on the type of predictions and forecasts you make with respect to inundation. So specifically, I, this little plot here, what, what I'm showing on the x-axis, we have elevation in meters. And on the y-axis, we have the percentage of homes along the shoreline that have elevations less than some level. So for instance, if I go to 75.9 meters of elevation and I read off, there's about 15% of the homes along the shoreline have an elevation that's less than that. That's sort of how you would read this plot. And by the way, 75.9 is about the, the high elevation for the 2019 flood. Now, importantly, if you start trying to make predictions of inundation by comparing forecasts of water levels to forecasts of homes, the uncertainty in all of those pieces of data make a huge difference in the predictions you make. And so we try and convey this on this plot by this little whisker, the set of whiskers is sort of showing plus and minus about 0.4-ish meters of uncertainty around a particular inundation prediction. And because that's about the amount of uncertainty we have from a variety of different data sources that I'll talk about in a second. And what the way you sort of read this is, okay, if, if I'm uncertain by 0.4 meters on the low end, my, I would actually only maybe predict that 6% of homes would be impacted by a particular water level event. But if I, my, if I look at my uncertainty on the high end, all of a sudden upwards of 40% of homes might be impacted by a high water event. This, is, this isn't, these bounds, don't take these numbers too literally because there's some details about how you actually do this calculation. But the point here is that the number of properties that actually would be impacted by a high water event, there's a pretty big range depending on the degree of uncertainty around the data you use. That's sort of the main message here. So we wanna make sure we propagate that uncertainty into the, the product that we create, but to do it in a way that's interpretable and just, but, you know, easy to understand. So here's a picture of basically the flowchart of the tool we created. And there's a bunch of components. I'm not gonna spend our time going over each and every one. Rather, I just point you to, to three or four big buckets of stuff that go into this particular model. So bucket number one, we need information on what the static lake level looks like for Lake Ontario and what that is forecasted to be out uh, a month ahead of time. Number two, we wanna model wave activity that can happen on top of that static water level. Number three, we wanna model storm surge and storm surge and wave activity are different. Storm surge is just added water bumping up against the coast and adding to the water level elevation. Waves then happen on top of that. We need information on the elevation of structures along the uh, shoreline. And what we would do is we'd sort of take the static water level, the waves and the storm surge, add those all up and that's the total water level. And you compare that to structure elevations to understand whether or not inundation would occur at any given spot. The last component though, is that there is uncertainty in all of those pieces, all those first four pieces. And we wanna sort of propagate that cumulative uncertainty into our particular predictions of inundation. We use a particular method, it's called the z-score method. The details of that don't matter. Uh, the punchline is that when we put all these pieces together, what we end up with is for every single parcel and building on a parcel, we are going to predict the probability, the likelihood that that parcel, that 
building on that parcel would be inundated a month ahead of time. That's sort of the goal. So what I'm gonna do is I'll quickly just go through some of the data sources we use in all of this, uh, in, the, in this procedure. So the first thing we really need is elevation data and we need to know where all the buildings are. So there's a lot of elevation data sources to draw from along the shoreline. Uh, there's FEMA has a DEM, NOAA has a DEM. Some counties have their own DEMs like Monroe. Um, all of those DEMs, they have some degree of uncertainty. So the, sorry, DEM is digital elevation model. And so we use this to sort of understand what the elevation at the ground would be at any particular location. But we recognize that there is some degree of uncertainty in that measure of elevation. In addition, we need to know where all the buildings are. Uh, Microsoft actually came out with a really cool uh, product sort of uh, developed with artificial intelligence where they created all these little, you see these little gray polygons. These are identified buildings across the shoreline. So we use this and we sort of now have a, a data set of all the buildings across the entire shoreline. I will mention for those who are interested, that Microsoft product is, is awesome, but there have been improvements on it. So uh, some counties have their own building footprint databases. And then there's just some other effort, for instance, out of Columbia University, where folks there are taking that uh, Microsoft product. And I, I feel terrible for the graduate students doing this, but they're going town by town and they're finding problems in it and they're fixing it. So there's sort of better products out there as well uh, that we, we use some of that as well in our, in our analysis. So we have elevations and we have where the buildings are. We also need to have a lot of information on what the water levels are going to be. And there's going to be a few different stages to this. Uh, one is we often want measured water levels across the shoreline. There's a series of gauges we can use to do that. There's some long-term gauges, for instance, at Cape Vincent, Olcott, Rochester, and Oswego. Those are run by NOAA. The USGS put in some recently new gauges in 2017 that are still going. So we can use all that data in some of our, our modeling. Uh, there's some trouble though, if you're trying to model what, for instance, storm surge in between those gauges, you know, if you're very far away from the gauges, what do you do? Do you interpolate between them? There's some uncertainty about what to do there. So we're also using uh, something that's called the Great Lakes Coastal Forecast System. This is out of the NOAA Glural National Lab. Um, it's a numerical model that they have of each of the Great Lakes. And one of the products that this numerical model spits out is sort of the best estimates of what the, the lake level is across the entire shoreline accounting for storm surge. And so we're also sort of ingesting some of this data into our model. We need to model wave runup, which is a separate process that needs to be considered. The Army Corps has a sort of what's called a modeled hindcast of offshore wave heights all across the shoreline. So we've been using some of this data as well to sort of figure out what the distribution of wave heights looks like anywhere along the shoreline. And then you can use, oh, and by the way, that, that data is pretty good. So we compared it to a, a one buoy that we found that was available that measured offshore wave heights. It does pretty decently. And then what you can do is you can use those offshore wave heights, put it through a wave run-up calculation. We use something called the Mays equation. And that'll, that'll allow you to estimate sort of, if you have an offshore wave, how far up could that wave push additional water up the shoreline, which might then in, impact structures further up the shore. So that's sort of how we would add up, add on top of the static waters and the storm surge, additional wave runoff activity. Okay, so that's all the data that we're using. And basically what I wanna do is sort of uh, compare two different ways we can use that data. And I'll focus on the one on the left first. So the one on the left is sort of a standard, what I'll call deterministic prediction of inundation. So this is a very common approach that's used in inundation mapping and modeling, where what people show on these maps is they show areas on the land that either will be or will not be inundated for some water level condition. And that is being shown on this map, wherever you see blue, that is where this particular deterministic model is saying you will have inundation at those spots and anywhere where there's green is saying you will not have inundation at those spots. And the way that that calculation is done, again, you take the total water level compared to the elevation at that particular location. 
If the total water level is higher, you say inundated, right? So it's a straightforward binary classification. The problem is that we know that there's a lot of uncertainty in a lot of that data we're using. So it's probably actually a bit more uh, appropriate instead of saying yes or no, you will be inundated under these conditions, really all we can say is with some probability, we think you'll be inundated under these conditions. And that's what this particular map on the right is showing. So here, the color scale, darker means a higher probability of inundation and lighter means a lower probability of inundation. And so here, there's a variety of locations. We're looking in Soda Bay, here's uh, Grig Street, where there are some places where there's a lot of certainty, a high probability that it's gonna be inundated under the conditions we're modeling here. But places that are lighter blue, there's a good chance you'd be inundated, but there's also a chance you wouldn't, and that's frankly the best we can say. And we wanna somehow convey that information to folks. And again, we're, we're using a particular approach to do this probabilistic modeling. It's called the Z-score method. All you do is you compare the structure elevation or your best guess of the structure elevation to the total water level or your best guess of the total water level, which is the static water level, storm surge and waves. And if this thing is positive, you, your best guess is that you won't be inundated. And if this difference is negative, your best guess is that you would be inundated. However, we account for the uncertainty in all of our data sources, and there's a lot of them. Uh, uncertainty in the LIDAR data that was used for elevation, when you have to interpolate between gauges or if you're using a model that, that now casts data from that coastal forecast system, measurement error in gauges, converting things between different datums when you do some of this GIS analysis, you add uncertainty in the process via that too. Um, whenever you have a forecast of static water levels, that's actually probably the biggest source of uncertainty it's hard to know what the storms are gonna be and how they're gonna come in over the next month. We just don't know that much about that. That's a very hard to do. That leads to a big spread in what the water levels could look like, as well as what the wind speed might look like and direction. So we wanna propagate that all, all of that uncertainty through when we sort of do it using this Z-score method approach. Okay. So what I wanna do now is I wanna do two things. One. I wanna show you a validation of this tool. So we, we built this tool and we gotta make sure it's working, right? And the way we're gonna make sure it's working is we're gonna not do forecasts for the moment. Rather, we're gonna take our tool, we're gonna to put in observed water levels and our best understanding of storm surge and waves at particular times in the past. And we're gonna compare those predictions of inundation from the tool to actual observations of inundation in particular days and years of the past. And we're going to see if the model is able to capture when things were inundated and when they weren't inundated. And that will sort of tell us how good the model is. Once we do that, once we do that validation, we'll then move over and show like how you would actually use this tool to make a forecast of inundation across the shoreline and then to visualize it. Okay. So in order to validate the tool, we first need observations of inundation, actually known parcels of land that were inundated at particular points in time in the past. We went ahead and we tried to collect a lot of data to do this. So uh, in 2017, the first sort of uh, effort of ours to collect this data, um, Cornell in conjunction with Sea Grant put out a survey to shoreline property owners asking them if they were being inundated during the 2017 event and what aspects of their property were being inundated. So we got a big collection of data from that. In addition, in 2017, the USGS, as well as the Eastern Dune Coalition did flyovers where they flew a plane and took pictures of uh, what the shoreline was looking like. And I had students go through and pull out individual homes where we could definitively say they were or weren't inundated in those flyovers where we knew the historic dates of those flyovers. And then 20, 2019, another organization, Save Our Sodas, did another flyover during that flood. And we did something similar where we pulled instances of known inundation from those flyovers. So what we do then is we can use those observations of inundation and compare them to the predictions of our model. And I'm gonna show you two versions of this. 
The first is if we use our model in what I'm going to call a deterministic mode, one where we don't propagate the uncertainty. And that's what I'm showing you here. I'm showing you five different tables. All the tables show the same thing. Um, they're just for different pieces of our data set. So table A is for all of our observations of inundation, the 458 total observations we have. And then tables B, C, D, and E are just broken up by the different observational products, the survey or the different flyovers. For our purposes, we can just focus on table A. So just look there. And what this table is showing is for all of the reports of inundation that we got, the actual observations of ground truth was a, was a parcel inundated or not, we just categorize, categorize that as the report saying no, a parcel wasn't inundated, or yes, a, or the building on a parcel was inundated. And then over here, we have whether or not the model in a deterministic mode without propagating uncertainty, did it predict no inundation or did it pre predict inundation? And you can see the total numbers that fall into those different pairs of categories as well as the percentages. And there's basically two take homes from this table. Number one, the model more than 50% of the time is correct. So whenever there was an inundation, the model predicted no inundation 30% of the time. And whenever there was inundation, the model got that right 29 total percent of the time. So 37 plus 29 is like 66% of the time, the model is making correct predictions. But what that means is 34% of the time or one third of the time, the model is wrong. It's either predicting inundation when it didn't happen or it's not predicting inundation when it did happen, right? And being wrong one in three times is not great. It's better than random, but it's not, as, it's not that good, right? I wouldn't think it's that good. So the question though is why is the model potentially doing so poorly? Why is it misclassifying one third of the time? And a lot of it has to do with those uncertainties in the underlying predictions. I'm going to try and show that on the next slide. So if we run our model in probabilistic mode, where we propagate that uncertainty through, now, instead of saying a parcel will or will not be inundated, what we say is there is some probability that that parcel will be inundated. And the way that we're showing this on this particular table, the way you would read it, if, for instance, you go to this top row, this is the row where our model is predicting somewhere between zero and 10% chance that a particular parcel would be inundated. So a very low chance that a parcel would be inundated. Of the parcels that fall into that category, 131 of our observed reports reported no inundation and 60 reported yes inundation. If you go to the second row, it's the same thing. These parcels are ones where our model was predicting between a 10 and 20% chance of inundation. And in reality, 12 of those parcels were not inundated and 14 were, and so on and so forth. What I draw your attention to is, is basically two things here. For the deterministic version of an inundation forecast, one where you say it's all, it's yes inundated or no, it's not gonna be inundated. That's basically, you would make a deterministic forecast of no inundation for anything with less than a 50% chance of inundation. So all of these parcels that actually had inundation, but had a, a less than a 50% chance of inundation, a deterministic model would say no inundation, they're gonna be dry. But in reality, many of these parcels have non-trivial probabilities of inundation, right? So if I, I'll just give you one specific example, this little box here, there are six buildings out there that were inundated our model said they had a 40 to 50% chance of being inundated, which is a pretty high chance. But a deterministic model would say, no, they're not gonna be inundated because the chance is less than 50%. That's a problem, right? You're, you're not conveying the risk to people well by taking those six homes and saying, you're not gonna be inundated when there was a really high chance they would have been. A lot of our misses actually had non-trivial probabilities of being inundated and therefore accounting for the data uncertainties accounts for a lot of that error that I showed on the previous slide. It doesn't account for all of it, 
but it does account for a, a big chunk of it. Okay. So we can, so that was sort of just an anecdotal sort of, or a, a, hopefully a somewhat simplified way of trying to express that. We could quantify it a, li a little bit better. I won't go into the details of this besides to say there is a particular metric we can use. It's called the Briar Skill Score. And it's one that we can use to quantify whether or not the probabilistic predictions or the deterministic predictions actually produce better forecasts. And the way I've set this up, anywhere the Briar Skill Score is positive above zero, that indicates that you really would want to use the probabilistic predictions. They do better than the deterministic ones. You can have a negative buyer skill score. You can have a situation where deterministic predictions do better because if your deterministic predictions are on the money all the time, you wouldn't want to fuzzy things up with probabilities of inundation. You would be happy with the deterministic black and white predictions of a deterministic model. However, what I'm showing in this plot is that for all of our data cut up in lots of different ways, so all of these little bars is our, our, our data, our observations of inundation, sometimes only on the open coast, sometimes only in embayments, from the survey product we put out on the coast and the embayment, from the dune flyover on the coast and the embayment, so on and so forth. For most ways of cutting up our data, the Briar skill score is positive, which means you would want to use the probabilistic predictions. They will convey the information more accurately. In addition, we were interested in sort of spatially, was our model more skillful in certain parts of the shoreline than others? So we looked at that as well. And we, so what I'm showing on these maps are model skill. How good is the model doing? And the way you'd read this, anywhere you see a green dot, the model is doing pretty good. A yellow dot, slight underestimation of risk. A red dot, a big underestimation of risk and then a light blue dot, a small oh, under overestimation of risk, and a dark blue dot, a big overestimation of risk. And two takeaways here. One, there's a lot of green dots along the shoreline. Our model generally does decently well. But in certain places, it can go either way. So for instance, uh, for a particular event on Grig Street, what we found was, uh, this was from 2017, our model was over predicting risk a little bit. Um, and this partly was because of the now cast data that we were using. It was overestimating the amount of surge that got it into the bay. So there's some error there. Also, it's kind of hard to see, but if we go to sort of near Rochester and Greece, there's a decent number of red dots there. So we're under predicting risk. That's actually being driven because we're underestimating wave runup. It's, it's hard to model how far waves are going to propagate over a vertical wall and move forward and pull in front of a house. That happens a lot. The model, it has a hard time getting that right. And so there are some parcels where we're underestimating risk. Okay, so what I wanna do now is show you that, that all of that was validation. Is the model working? And I think the take home is it's working decently well. There are some places it could do better, but overall, as long as you propagate the uncertainties through, the model is doing decently well. Now, how would you use this to actually make a forecast four weeks ahead of time of inundation and show it to people. And so what we do here is there's a few different data sources we can pull from. Uh, number one, uh, many of you might be familiar with some of the water level outlooks that the Army Corps of Engineer puts out. Also Environment Climate Change Canada puts out uh, monthly forecasts of water levels. So we are pulling those. And what we're doing is we're going a month out, looking at the range of uncertainty of their forecasts. And we pull both of those things, their best estimate of what the future static lake levels are going to be, but also the uncertainty around those static levels. And we push that into our forecasting model. In addition, we want to give people the ability to, to play around with scenarios of storm surge in the forecasts. And so the way we do this is, and I'll show you on the tool, we let the user choose certain directions of wind speed and the magnitude of wind speed. And then we go to that nowcast database and we use something called the mixer distribution. The details don't matter here, but we try and get a sense of the range of storm surges you could see under those wind conditions. And we also propagate that into our forecasts as well. 
So we do that, and then this comes to sort of the tool demonstration. So how will you actually use this tool? And I'll, I'll make this um, quick. Basically, I have two slides. One, this is what the actual opening slide of the tool looks like. So if you were to go to the link for the Lake Ontario flood mapper, you'll get a picture of Lake Ontario, a description of what the model does, and a description of terms of use, what the model can and, and frankly cannot do. And if you continue, you'll then be able to zoom in to different parts of the shoreline and click on certain counties you want to look at and make a map of the likelihood of inundation. And so for a particular uh, updated forecast that is current. So for instance, this is a map of what, I think this was developed in 20, early 2019, or maybe a little bit, maybe in July of 2019 actually. But what we're showing here is a forecast of the likelihood of inundation for Greg Street in Sodas Point. And the way you'd read this is anywhere you see a light yellow color, that means that there is a low risk of inundation, something between zero and 5%. Anywhere you see an orange color, there is a more of a moderate risk of inundation, something between five and 50%. And anywhere there is a red color, there's a high risk. So greater than 50% chance that you'd be inundated a month out. Those ranges we actually got from stakeholder feedback, particularly municipal officials didn't want us to underestimate the low risk category. So they wanted those like the zero to 5%, don't go higher than 5% when you say low risk. Other pe otherwise people might not respond. Uh, very well. In addition, on this particular tool, if you look down here, you can pick the wind direction and the wind speed that you'd like to see, and the model will recalculate these risk levels, accounting for storm surge associated with those wind directions and speeds. So you can also embed that in the forecast that you have. Um, I have the link I can pass around if people like to sort of play around with this. Um, it's sort of like, it kind of looks like Google Maps, so it's, it should be relatively intuitive, hopefully, for folks to sort of pan around to different parts of the shoreline and look at current levels of risk. I was going to show a live demonstration, but because water levels have come down a bit, um, there just isn't much risk of inundation right now in many of the low-line areas. And so it, mo most of these maps are blank if I show the current tool as it exists. Okay. So what I want to conclude with just a couple minutes is, is where we want to go with some of this work. Uh, so basically, there's three main things I'd like to, to do going forward and that we're working on right now. Uh, a lot of the uncertainty in the forecasts we have, and we always want to reduce uncertainty wherever we can, that'll be of most value to folks. Uh, most of that uncertainty comes from forecasts of static lake levels a month out. Again, it's hard to know what storms are going to roll through. And so if you can improve those forecasts at the static levels, you can provide more informative inundation forecasts for people to react to. So we'd like to do that. There's also ways to improve some of the storm surge and wave runup modeling that we're doing. And then finally, we can, we can probably improve how we then communicate this information to folks. So one idea, uh, you might be able to come up with an automated system that assesses risk parcel by parcel at a weekly time step and then email notifications to people who are at high risk. We don't have a system like that in place, so we haven't started to develop one, but it was just an idea that maybe that would be useful for folks. Uh, I will sort of go into those first two items just for a, a minute or two. Uh, so there has been a lot of work in uh, academic institutions as well as national labs to improve the lake level forecasting, the static lake level forecasts uh, on all five of the Great Lakes. So many are, pro are probably seeing these sort of older versions of the lake level outlooks on a monthly basis. There are new experimental versions of these forecast models that are trying to um, use remotely sensed data and state of the art climate models to improve and reduce the uncertainty of some of these monthly forecasts. So we would wanna ask, how much added value do you get with the most state-of-the-art products? Can you bring down this forecast uncertainty two, three, four weeks out? And then how much utility is that for, for local communities to make better decisions? There's also some interesting things at seasonal timescales you can do 
this is a busy plot. You don't really have to see too much of what's going on here. The main thing I'm trying to convey is that we're doing some research that are trying to look at big climate hemispheric scale mechanisms that influence how much rain falls over the Great Lakes in different seasons and how forecastable those things are out one, two, three months ahead of time. So can we get better, longer seasonal lead forecasts as well? And we think there might be some potential to do that with respect to, for instance, some of the more state-of-the-art El Nino forecasts that are out there. There might be some benefit that can be levered for the Great Lakes. One other thing that we want to spend some time trying to work on is, and this is just for people who want to nerd out on some of the math of the modeling, uh, which I know is a large group of people. Uh, but when you're trying to quantify surge risk, the risk of storm surge, um, how you do that probabilistic modeling actually changes the outcome a decent amount of what the risk looks like for individual people. So we're basically interested in how likely is a surge event of 0 0.05 meters or 0 0.1 meter at a particular location. And depending on the probability model you use, you'll get different estimates of that. And there's probably some work that could be done to improve this for along the, sh the lake shore. And then finally, I'll end with one other thing that I'm really interested to try. I don't know if it's going to work. A lot of our ability to model flood risk, particularly with respect to wave activity, is we need to know what the vertical walls look like, the shoreline protection structures look like on all the parcels across the entire shoreline. And there frankly just isn't very good data on that. And so one idea we might float is trying to use a series of high resolution imagery that's recently been taken, pair it with a lot of recent LIDAR data sets that are out there, elevation data sets, and trying to use machine learning algorithms to see if they can't identify vertical walls and shoreline protection structures, pull off the LIDAR data on those structures, and get estimates of vertical wall heights for parcels across the shoreline. This could potentially really improve the modeling of wave run up in a, in a big way. It, I don't know if it's going to work. It's, it's, it's a, maybe one of these like low likelihood of working, but if it worked, big impact sort of thing. So we're helpful. So with that, I'll, I'll end, just sort of conclude and say, you know, the goal was to produce a probabilistic flood tool that can provide actionable flood risk forecasting information that hopefully specifically is targeting short-term emergency response at local scales. It was designed based on our best understanding of what stakeholders needed based on what they told us. Um, the model's predictions are decently accurate, particularly if you propagate its underlying uncertainties through. There are some places where it could be improved by focusing on the science of specific coastal processes. And more broadly, one thing I'll, I'll end with is that this model really is just one component of a larger suite of tools that New York Sea Grant has been developing to support shoreline communities and preparing for flooding uh, along the coast. And so the hope is that we can sort of bring a lot of these tools together in one place and uh, provide just a, a suite of models and, and tools that can be used to uh, improve adaptation along the shoreline. And with that, I'll end. I just want to acknowledge New York Sea Grant for not only all the support for this work, but also direct engagement and contributions to this work a lot of uh, federal agencies that provided the models and tools necessary to do this work, as well as a lot of local municipalities and, and local groups that also provided data and interacted with our team a lot to make sure that we were able to make the best tool we could for, for local communities. And with that, I'll, I'll end and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Scott. That was an excellent presentation. So uh, what we're going to do is uh, uh, open up to uh, questions. Uh, you can uh, text me in the in the chat room, or uh, um, use the Zoom to raise your hand, and I will unmute you, or I will read your uh, question. Um, there was uh, a request to uh, have the tool. Uh, to post the link to the tool. And uh, I believe I got that. Uh, Ron Fisher was able to present that to me. So I'm going to, I'm going to post that to the group right now. Um, also, if um, I'd like to remind everybody to fill out the uh, survey after the, uh, after the talk is over today. And uh,
I'm going to uh, post uh, Scott, make, make sure that this is the right link. Oh, I didn't did it to didn't do it to everyone. There we go. All right, that's the link to the tool. Is that right, Scott? And um, uh, let me see. It looks correct. I'm going to need to leave uh, presentation mode to check all this. So here it is. I might use this one. I think the one that was in there was a previous version. And the one that I have here is the one that is automatically being updated. OK. So I think the, the one I have up here, I believe, was most recently updated with August 10th uh, static water level forecasts. All right. And let me, uh, so um, there was a comment earlier in the presentation from Alan Springett. Um, I'm just going to read it and then you can comment. It, it says you should be, it should be understood that the current FEMA flood model for Lake Ontario was developed by use of the program AdCirc and SWAN simultaneously running and each program passing data back and forth to I iteratively develop the surge. That surge still water already includes a wave runoff value. So it is necessary to not add an additional wave runoff to that still water. And which, so with respect to a FEMA product? Yeah, it's referring a current FEMA flood model for uh, Lake ah, Ontario. Sure, yeah, yeah. So we are not using the FEMA flood model and flood uh, plane projections that we're not talking about that. FEMA had a DEM, a digital elevation model of the land elevation that we use, but that is the only, only FEMA pro data product we're using in this forecasting tool. The other thing I'd mention, and this is, this is important, because uh, it, the, well, I, I don't think it's actually reflected in this particular comment, but I'll, I'll say it anyway. You know, the, the FEMA floodplain maps, those are long-term flood, flood risk maps, right? The chance of a particular location being inundated with some likelihood over long periods of time. That's different than a short-term forecasting product. And I just want to make that sort of distinction very clear because often in our conversations with the folks, those things have gotten mixed up a bit. And so I just want to sort of make that distinction clear. But in response to that particular comment, we are not using the FEMA water levels associated with those floodplain maps, which do have wave runup baked into them. We are simply using the FEMA elevation data and the FEMA DEM built on a, a LIDAR data set for the elevations of the land surface separate. Uh, we have a question from Tom. Uh, this tool is used for structural inundation and not property flooding. Is the model dynamic to account for changes in elevation of vertical walls along the shoreline to predict what wave runoff will impact? That's a great question. And this is sort of our, what I was trying to get at with the very last slide there. So th there's two parts to that. One is changing vertical wall heights and their influence on wave runup. Um, and the first part of that question was, actually, can you reread it just for a second? Because there are two parts, I think. Um, is, uh, yeah, um, it's structural inundation and not property flooding. Is the model yeah. dynamic to account for changes in elevation of vertical walls along the shoreline to predict what the wave runoff will impact? Got it. So with respect to property inundation or structural inundation, so on the maps we're showing, we show maps of the likelihood of inundation for any location, property or the home. It was sort of a continuous map of shading, right? So you could sort of get a sense of the likelihood that the front part of your lawn might be under, and that might be different than the probability that the foundation of your home would be inundated. With respect, so that's sort of those, those maps that we showed, that's, we're doing both. 
With respect to wave runup activity, and one thing I should be very clear about, we do wave runup calculations specifically to determine whether or not the foundation of the home would be inundated because the tool that we got and have adapted, that's how it was set up to, to run. And so the wave runup forecasting part of this is specifically associated with the risk of inundation to the foundation of a, of a particular structure, the a home. With respect to your question on, does this account for a dynamic vertical wall height? Says it, no. This is a very big problem with all modeling along the lakeshore. It is very difficult to even get a good baseline data set of what the vertical walls and shoreline protection structures look like across the entire lakeshore, let alone how that is changing as people rebuild additional um, uh, structures, for instance, in response to the 2017 and 2019 flood. So absolutely, and it's sort of in the, uh, uh, well, let's just call it a disclaimer or term of use of the product, you need to use this particular tool as a screening level assessment of what the flood risk would look like. But we are not going to be able to provide information on how the most up-to-date and current set of shoreline protection structure that maybe have recently been built would impact what the flooding actually would be. That requires an on-site, highly detailed assessment that cannot be done shore-wide. So yeah, I wanna sort of emphasize the use of this tool as a good screening level assessment of should you start getting worried about potential impacts um, given what's in the forecasts coming your way over the next month. All right, we have a, a, a question from uh, Kamazima. I'm gonna unmute him and uh, I'll let him uh, ask his question. Kamazima, ask away. Uh, thank you very much, Scott, for a great talk. I really enjoyed it. Uh, I have uh, two questions. One may be very simple. The first one is, uh, what do you think are the sources of the errors in the static level forecast? Where do you, and I, I ask this because I'm a marine physicist and uh, that's what, what interests me most. Are you asking what, what are the biggest sources? sources yes. Yeah, Good. so for, for this particular tool, probably the biggest source of uncertainty is in, in forecast mode, when we're trying to make a forecast, probably the biggest source of uncertainty is what are the static water levels on Lake Ontario going to be a month ahead of time? Because it's, it's very dependent on several big factors that are hard to know. Um, one major one is what storms are going to roll your way over the next two, three, four weeks. Weather forecasts are only good out to maybe a week, right, at best. And so it's just really hard to know what that's going to look, what, what the incoming water supply is going to look like. In addition, the waters are managed. The forecast that we're using does take into account the management of the lake, uh, given the operational rules of the dam that controls it. But that being said, the board that manages the lake, they have recently been deviating from the management plan. And so it, it, there is a, a deal of uh, some uncertainty around what that will look like in terms of the effects of management as well. But I, I, I do think the biggest uncertainty is actually in the water supply over a month ahead. Um, that would be a, probably the, the largest one. And then the, the second largest one, if there is a wind event, you will have a totally different experience than if there isn't wind event. And a month ahead of time, we cannot tell you if there's going to be some sort of a storm surge event. Um, we can only tell you what the likelihood of different storm surge values are at that lead time. And so those two things together probably bump out the uncertainty bounds on this thing the most. That's great. Thank you very much. Can I ask you the second question, Lane, please? Yes, go ahead. Uh, for the probability uh, function or for the surge you, you showed, what surprised me it is almost almost looks like a normal distribution and I expected this being some kind of an extreme kind of event, it would have a different, you know, a short tailed kind of long tail on one side and a short tail on the other, but it didn't. Do you have any idea why? 
Yeah, sure. So, and I'll, uh, I'll bring that back up. So what I'm showing here is the distribution of hourly surge for all hours of a 30 year long-term record. So on most hours in the record, there isn't much surge going on, right? Uh, yeah. It's near zero and it's just not much going on. So that's why it looks normal-esque. However, what I think what you're, what you're thinking of, and the, my terminology might be a little bit misleading because when we think of surge, we think of an actual surge event. That's really happening in the tail of this distribution. So when you actually get large positive surge values, that is where a normal distribution will not work. So if I fit a normal distribution here, it will do decent for the body of these very small values. Once we get out into the tails, it does very bad, which is why I've been playing around with different distributions to do the tails, like a generalized Pareto or a student T. Um, and the trick is like, can you actually regionalize those statistical models to places along the shoreline where you don't have gauged data, which is a lot of them. And so right now I'm actually working on another project on a like a Bayesian model to do just that, which we can then weave into this tool. But you're absolutely right. For the big values, the big surge events, you will need a different type of probability model than a normal distribution to get that correct. Thank you. All right, anybody else have any questions? Anybody have their hands raised? Anybody else? You did such a good job, Scott, that everybody has their questions answered. So uh, on the chat, I have a link to the website for the seminars. Our, this seminar is recorded and will be posted on that website at that link. It'll also be in our YouTube channel. Um, and the, uh, uh, and it'll be, uh, and the other uh, seminars from earlier are also on our website and the announcement for the next website in September featuring Colin Lindbergh is also up there. We'll be sending out uh, information about that in the next week or so. And um, also we'll put the links that were mentioned in this talk on that on the website too. So when you go to uh, the research seminars link on our website that I posted, uh, you'll see the video for this talk and we'll also post the links that, uh, that were in the, uh, in the chat. So you can have access to those. Um, anybody else have any questions? Not, I will, I will say thanks for attending everybody. Thank you, Scott, for a really excellent presentation. It was really good. Thanks everyone for uh, being on the, uh, on the talk and we'll see you next month in September. Thanks everybody. Thanks, Lynn.